western cities captured by Iraq during the Iran-Iraq war. That is the myth that the, any military organization wants to, to preserve, of course. Uh, so, so the Revolutionary Guard is not, not exactly willing to, to risk that. Uh, so so they, they may have different calculations. Uh, 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 but uh, when it comes to, uh, to, to obeying or not obeying orders, uh, if the Revolutionary Guards has so much to win in the end, uh, especially at a situation where the civilian leadership is factionalized, uh, is going in, in, into pieces, uh, and in reality, the Revolutionary Guards can become the Algerian military junta of Iran, you know, dividing the oil money. Why should they hesitate? I'll quickly just add on this. One thing, uh, and I know uh, Ali has given this um, some serious thought and analysis to it, which is <coughs> we shouldn't look at about 150,000 strong member IRGC as a united mm -hmm. entity. There are divisions within the IRGC. We should take that into account. Uh, the other thing I say about it is, it seems to me that often when it comes to IRGC, and I would uh, extend that to the armed forces in general, it's a question of quality more and so in the Iranian case than quantity. So 145,000, they could certainly add in terms of numbers to it. They have chosen to go with the besiege when it comes to quantity to try and sort of shock and all the enemy saying we can have, I've seen outrageous figures that they can mobilize 10 million besieged. There's no evidence on this planet that can justify such a claim, but that's what the regime says. But they really have cut back in terms of, you know, conscription ser service has gone from 24 months to 20 months, I believe it is now. IRGC are the ones they're spending money on, both in terms of training, equipment, and so forth. And the question, obviously, there, as a return, one would suspect they want more loyalty out of you. And as Ali pointed out, in the recent unrest, we've seen no real case of IRGC being in the forefront of facing the protesters. There hasn't really been a need. There hasn't really been a need. If the day came where there's a need, then the big question, to go back to what Patrick sa said, is what are they going to be asked to do? To beat somebody in the head is different than shooting somebody in the head. The question is what will the regime ask them to do? And then we, I don't really think anybody can, can sit here or sit in Iran for that matter and predict how that core will react, th those sort of orders. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Bob Dreyfus with The Nation. Um, you didn't mention when you were discussing about, about political factions and all that in Iran, the, the uh, sort of a not, what I would call a non-revolutionary guard principle of people like the Larisanis and the people in parliament. Before the election, there was a lot of churning among conservatives in parliament who were kind of grumpy about Ahmadinejad on a number of things, cabinet members and things like that. Um, have they just all submerged now because of the repression or <coughs> is there any possibility of these guys and Rafsanjani and the reformist kind of, you know, creating some kind of popular front uh, kind <laughs> of alliance, or is that um, out of the question? Very quickly, to my mind, I would divide the opportunist class, as Ali referred to them before, into two old opportunist class, and I'll put Rafsanjani in that class, who is now finding himself, he was pushed in that direction, but is now with the opposition. There are many indications that show he doesn't really like to be where he is, but that's life. He's been pushed in that direction. But the new opportunist class, you can talk about the Larijani brothers, the three of them, and others uh, who are, you know, you can say, I try and put neutral, say, what, what does neutral mean? But these are people arguably on the fence. And I would say if there's one major driver that pushes them this way or the other is what the supreme leader wants them to do. So we see Larijani going against Ahmadinejad's government, or going against the opposition based on what we hear hearing coming out of the Supreme Leader's office. So there are people who are looking at their position in the Nizam, in the regime, totally tied into the future, the survival of the Supreme Leader. You can call them opportunists, I would. Mr. Ali Larijani, as, as you of course know, you know, Speaker of the Parliament, he's born in Najaf. He is an Iraqi Iranian. And uh, he uh, was a follower of uh, Ayatollah Shah Rudi, the former head of judiciary. Uh, the Iranian Iraqis, you know, who uh, were expelled out of Iraq in 1979-1980, count approximately 250,000 people. So Mr. Larijani's main network is 250,000 Iranians who were expelled out of Iraq in 1979-1980, two, a quarter of a million people. They are overrepresented in the security services, in the intelligence ministry, because the system trusted them more in the beginning of the 1980s, more than Iranians, average Iranians. Because these Iraqis knew that if the Islamic Republic became a, 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 you know, a failure, uh, they had nowhere else to go. 
so, so, so they are overrepresented in, in, in the security services, and, and they are influential. A part of the bazaar in Tehran is controlled by, 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 by these people, uh, uh, but they, uh, their influence in the Revolutionary Guards is, is not so, so, so strong. Mr. Larijani considers himself uh, uh, the, the, the next president of Iran. He genuinely believes that at some point, uh, Supreme Leader Khamenei is going to point at him. And uh, Mr. Larijani would also not at all mind if uh, Supreme Leader uh, um, at some point abandons Ahmadinejad, allows the parliament to uh, start you know, a process against Mr. Ahmadinejad, not because of political reasons, but let's say because of economic mismanagement. Uh, at, at, you know, at some point, there is a vote of no confidence for Mr. Ahmadinejad, and Mr. Larijani uh, becomes the savior of the nation. And that, that is the way Mr. Larijani thinks. You know. uh, he is the non, uh, 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 rather than opportunistic, I would say, because all politicians have to be opportunistic to varying degrees. Uh, I, I consider Mr. Larijani a non-populist conservative, rather than you know, Mr. Mr. Ahmadinejad, who is the populist one. Uh, so, so that is one. Another candidate who is very interesting is Tehran Mayor Mr. Ghalibaf, who is also a former Revolutionary Guards member. So, so these two uh, uh, characters and persons are certainly working against Mr. Ahmadinejad, trying to convince the Supreme Leader that Mr. Ahmadinejad is uh, uh, not an asset but, but a li liability for the regime. One very quick point, Bob, on the central, uh, the, the sort of centrists. Look at the case of Mohsen Rezaei, former long-time 16-year IRGC commander who ran against Ahmadinejad. Look at the reaction that he generated when he asked for reconciliation. He said, you hardliners and you opposition come together, otherwise the entire Islamic Republic will collapse. <coughs> Look how he was treated by the hardliners. The hardliners are the ones who want to push you in either that camp, opposition, i.e. supported by the United States and the Israelis and all the rest of it, or you're with us and you don't say anything. So I think the center in Iranian politics right now, at least going by the Mohsen Rezaei case, has had a tough time to express themselves. Favoring the front, uh, this is the gentleman in the back here. Uh, hi, uh, Vijay Nilekani. I'm an MEI member. Uh, my question is about the Kurds. The Kurds in Iraq and in Turkey have a very strong identity as Kurds, and Iran has a quite a Kurdish population. What is their status? Are they well integrated into Iranian society, or do they have the same kind of alienation and uh, differentiation that the Kurds have in Turkey and Iraq? Thank you. Should I, I mean, uh, quickly, yes, you're right. 10% of the population is Kurdish, about 7 million. Major, you know, uh, feature, I guess, is that not only are they not Persian, although they're very close ethnically and linguistically to the Persian majority, but they also happen to be Sunnis, but they're not that religious. There are also Shias. Among there are also Shias, yeah. minority Shias in the south in Elam province. Um, the thing I, I say about the Kurds uh, is, again, w we had a question relating to the Kurdish issue before. I haven't seen... Love to hear what Ali has to say on this. I haven't seen any tendencies lately or that represent an escalation of what's always existed in Kurdish uh, provinces or Kurdish popula populated areas of Iran, a te tendency that indicates an increase in militancy or trying to take advantage of the situation. I haven't seen that. I think that would much more likely be tied to what happens in Iraqi Kurdistan than what happens in Tehran. I think if Iran economically goes down the hill in years to come, and what happens on the other side is nothing but sort of rosy. The Iranian Kurds, because that is, again, a Im relatively impoverished part of Iran, they will look to the other side of the border and say, why not us? The Iranians know about this. Supreme Leader spent 10 days hiking in Iranian Kurdistan. He spent 10 days hiking. He made a gesture. He announced that now the Sunnis can have the prayer to, uh, to th the call for prayer in the Sunni tradition, and I, I can't remember, he did something else. Oh yes, 